is nothing, only warm primordial blackness. Your conscious ferments in it, no larger than a single grain of malt. You don't have to do anything anymore. Ever. Never, ever. Never, ever, ever, baby. And an audience amount of time passes. It is utterly void of struggle. No ex-wives are contained within it. Yes, it is. An awareness creeps up on you. A mass lies hidden in your dead angle. Soaking in some lurid acidic source, it's bloated and shameful. A ball of meat surrounding you. This is a terrible line of questioning, and it will only lead to more awareness of the meat thing. There. No ball of meat. No light in the formless nothing. Just nice women. I know you do, baby. I know. Coming right up, sir. Smooth passage. All right. Nothing town to fuck all, borough. Do you want me to upgrade that to a one-way trip, sir? The song of death is sweet and endless. But what is this? Somewhere in the sore, bloated man meet around you. A sensation. Like a fly to the ointment, your conscience sticks to it. The limbed and headed machine of pain an undignified suffering is firing up again. It wants to walk the desert, hurting, longing, dancing to disco music. The stench of liquor rises from your mouth, and with it, an ungodly headache. A fiery streak penetrates your skull, trying to force your eyes open. It's a sound, a clarion call from hell. Somehow, you know what it is. A caprice to name a motor carriage. You hear a jingle. Keys are clinking in the pocket of your flare cut pants. It says whirling in rags on the aluminium key ring. There is a single key on the ring. 
The number one is etched on it. It should open the door. This fan has two chain pull switches. One ends in a tiny fan, the other in a light bulb. A truly horrific necktie has somehow attached itself to one of the blades. You reach out to grab the tie, but what's this? Diffuse, radiating chest pain. Doom comes over you. You feel something in your chest, an unnatural pressure. It's spreading to your left arm, your jaw. Very, very bad. This is the end, bad. All you feel is pain and weakness. You have to surrender now. We all do. It gets so dark. You don't even see her face. Like you always thought you would. You only see pain and fear. Cop suffers final heart attack. A detective lieutenant of the RCM passed away yesterday. His death, though abrupt, did not come as a surprise to those who knew him. He was the heaviest drinker I'd ever met. Captain Ptolemy Price, the deceased superior officer, commented. That ain't easy on the ticker. He loved his liquor, sure, said Detective Chester McLean, friend and colleague. But I think before he ever had a heart attack, his heart was broken. According to an official statement given by the RCM, the officer was on the brink of solving a murder case. There is nothing ever, never, ever. An inordinate amount of time. Yes. An awareness creeps up on you. There. No, I know. Coming right up, sir. All right. Nothing. Do you want me to upgrade that to a one way trip, sir? Do you really? The song of death is sweet and endless, like a fly to the... You can take it. You're a champion. The stench of liquor rises from your mouth, and with it, an ungodly headache. A fiery streak penetrates your skull. Somehow, you know what it is. A caprice to me in You 
hear a jingle. It says, whirling in rags. This fan has two chain pull switches. One ends in a tiny fan, the other in a light bulb. Or has it been consigned there as punishment? You feel as though this creature is your friend and wants to reattach itself to your neck so that you may continue your adventures together in this strange world. A terrible mistake. Turn the lights off immediately. You can practically feel the photons burning a hole in your brain. You feel something in your chest, an unnatural pressure. It's spreading to your left arm, your jaw. Yeah, screaming isn't happening on account of extreme shortness of breath. You're just making it worse. Oh God, it's painful. There's no shame in surrendering now. We all do. Cop suffers final heart attack. A detective lieutenant of the RCM. This fan has two chain pull switch. Or has it been consigned there? The blades come squeaking to a halt. It should be easier to reach the tie now. You reach out to grab the tie, but what's this? You feel something in your chest, an unnatural pressure. It's spreading to your left. No, it's many years of combined self-neglect. There's no shame in cop suffers final heart attack. This fan has two chain pull switches. Or has it been the blades come squeaking to a halt? It should be. You swoop up and catch the tie. Snap. It's released from the blade. Warning, warning. The necktie is no longer contained. What you have in your hand is a fantastically colorful tie with four or five different patterns. The knot reminds you of a noose. If it's your friend, why was it up there? Who ties their friend to a ceiling fan? Maybe this thing is dangerous somehow. An ominous foreboding feeling fills you as you look at the tie. A mirror hangs above a bent and broken sink. In a first discharge of masculine energy, someone has ripped half the faucet off. Hot water sprays from the base and steam covers the mirror. You cannot see yourself, 
just the outline of a man. Suddenly, you realize you have no memory of the face that awaits you there, underneath the soft vapor. Really, all recollection of the person you are, the people in your life, and even the world you're in, has drowned in a sea of blood alcohol. This was no mere night of drinking. It was a deluge of world-ending proportions. As you slowly reach your hand towards the surface of the mirror, Abort. You clearly have not thought this through. You won't like what you see there, and you will never unbecome it. Yeah, there is definitely something wrong with it. Where to even begin? There is the bloatedness, then the swollenness. It's like there's an upholstery of alcohol underneath your skin. It's not. It's swollen and snail-like, wriggling between your fingers. It's not. Your nose feels like a small balloon in the middle of your face. It hurts when you honk it. It doesn't appear to be a particularly tiny nose either. Not with all the drinks it's absorbed for you. Behold. You have no idea who this thing is, do you? Whatever it is, at least it's dead now. There's clearly rigor mortis on your face. Oh wait, is that an expression? Are you trying to make an expression with that face? Please stop. It's horrible. You're scaring yourself. Oh my God. You can't stop. It's like it's not even voluntary anymore. You have worn that grin into your face and now it won't come off. What does it even mean? What is the emotion you're trying to convey? There might have been, ten years ago. It's little more than a cadaverous spasm now. It belongs in the new, the third decade of the current century. Enough time had passed from the failure of the revolution that, for a fleeting moment, free market economy seemed like the ultimate, uncontested way of life for our species. Things were good. It was smooth sailing. People made gold and champagne-tinted interiors and facades to suit the times, calling this the new style. But more importantly, disco happened. For Revachol, your city, that meant only one thing. Guillaume La Million. If it doesn't rhyme, you're not pronouncing it right. Out of the dazzling swirl of disco music, in an open air, Boite de Nuit, somewhere in Revachol West, Guillaume's blonde mane appeared on the screen. He sang some bullshit. Then he made the expression. The click is used to spur on a horse. It also features heavily in Guillaume Le Million's regional mega hit, Don't Worry, Your Pretty Little Head. Everyone loved it. Maybe you thought some of the stardust would rub off on you. Maybe it did. Either way, it's all gone now. Only the grimace remains. Some twenty odd years, there is a vast ocean of time between right now and the expression. Looking good on you, or anyone. Humanity has run aground in that time. It's a different world now. The expression is a relic. 
You have some understanding of the near history of disco. The rest is darkness. Aside from the useless fact that the motor carriage outside was a Caprice Canema. It doesn't have to be. You can swoon over Guillaume and his champagne cork smile whenever you want to. Maybe some of the stardust will return. It's too late. Like an image on film. The expression belongs to your primary motor cortex. It would take a minor neurological miracle for you to cease producing it. The window stands broken in its frame. Cold wind blows in. The morning light hurts your eyes. It's hazy, but you see the ocean and some war-torn buildings. The shards face outward. Whatever broke this window came from the inside. A fine web of scarring covers the back of your right hand, but none of it is recent. More likely a projectile than a held object. There are no fragments on the floor from pulling a tool back in after impact. Something you've done before. It is too large for a bullet, yet too small for a piece of furniture. You're looking for something heavy and larger than your fist. The single green shoe you found fits the hole almost as well as your foot. It would have also been heavy enough if thrown with force. Congratulations. You smashed the window with your own shoe. Now you only have one. If you're lucky, you could still find the other one on the balcony outside. The door to it should be outside your room. A cool wind gushes in. Your toes curl up from the cold. There they both are, two identical shoes, both copiously green and indiscriminately snakeskin, reunited on your feet, like two baby crocodiles. Good, they're balanced, comfy, feels like the only good thing about you right now, truth be told.
Hello, officer. The young woman raises a cigarette to her lips. A silver jumpsuit falls off her like scale armor, sparkling. This is the sparkle of too many nights out on the city. Uh, no. There's only one solution to this. You're a businessman. The young woman shakes her head slowly. Officer could be an artistic statement, a claim to official renown. No, you're a police officer, sir. I'm not, unless you've been shitting us all this time. You've been here for three days, on official police business, no less. Couldn't say. In truth, so far, mostly drinking. You have no doubt about the drinking, but do you strike yourself as a tight-lipped drunk? She must have heard something. She nods. There's a mercenary out back. He's been hanged. The body has been there for a week now. The locals probably got tired of it and called the cops. I didn't mean to overwhelm you with information. You seem a bit lost, officer. Could it be because of the drinking? Don't be so harsh on yourself. They let almost anyone be a police officer. A glib remark. Don't let it stand. Assert yourself. A fondness for contradictory statements. Extraordinary. She doesn't actually think it's all that extraordinary. Of course. Be careful, officer. They don't like the police around here. She looks back at you, a light glinting off her eyes. Goodbye. Probably need them 
more than he does. You gently shake his shoulder, but nothing happens. This man could probably sleep soundly in a ship's engine room. You should totally sing karaoke here, the first chance you get. Your emotions need to be expressed. People need to know your vast oceanic soul. Of course, at this point, precise measurements of your soul can only be performed from the outside. It needs to be heard. Through a PA system. By other people. You have not yet stumbled on the right lamentation, but it's out there. It'll come to you. You will wreak havoc with it. Don't worry. Serves them right. Wipe that smirk off their face with your sad, tragic song. Who's laughing now? No one. You have to find something tragic to sing first, though. A man in his late twenties stands behind the counter, inspecting a stuffed seabird. As you approach, he gives you a sideways glance, then looks down again. That was disdain in his eyes. Even now he's purposely ignoring you. No, I'm not the bartender. I'm the cafeteria manager. Mm hmm. Oh no, you're a hero. A real hero cop. Could the massive property damage upstairs have anything to do with this? Am I? Or did you ride in? Take the body down, solve the murder, and not trash my hostel room? No, you see, actually, you didn't. You haven't done anything even remotely useful since you got here. No, I haven't seen you around. I'm not always here. A competent work of taxidermy. The white and brown seabird lies among piles of coasters and drying mugs, one of its wings broken. The man is trying to mend it. Looks like the bird was ripped off the shield that was used to mount it, most likely on a wall. This is the great skewer. The seabird is the symbol for the discovery of the Insulindian Isola, the part of the world you are in right now. Something about it makes you feel bitter. Look, your buddy is over there. Why don't you go and talk to him, okay? He pretends not to hear you, concentrating on the bird instead. A competent work of tech. Looks like the bird. This is the great skewer. Something about it makes you feel bitter. Look, your buddy. Why don't you go and talk to him? He pretends not to hear.
bespeckled man in an orange bomber jacket is tapping his foot on the floor. Looks like he's waiting for someone. You. As you approach, he narrows his eyes and extends his hand in greeting. If an assault were launched on this building right now, if the windows came crashing down and the whole world descended upon you, this man would hurl himself in death's way to save you. You are sure of this, but why? He is your half-brother. Hello, I'm Kim Kitsuragi, Lieutenant, Precinct 57. You must be from the 41st. You realize he is waiting for your name. This is your chance to come up with a really good name for yourself. Get creative. Conceptualize. Very well, officer. It looks like we had a little scheduling error on Sunday. Saturday too, actually. Have you had time to talk to the manager here? What he means is, he has been trying to meet up with you for two days, but you have been otherwise occupied. Then we should ask him for a rundown of the area, get me up to speed. I understand the scene is out back, right? It also wouldn't hurt to assure him the police are finally here. In full force, I mean. Have you mapped out the initial interviews? Okay, we'll have time for that after we take a look at the coroner's case. Have you removed the dead body from the tree? Sure, but did you take it down from the tree? Completely. Does that mean you took the body down from the tree? So, the body is still in the tree. This is the first time you detect a weariness in the lieutenant's voice. It is obvious he would have preferred for the body to no longer be in the tree where it has been hanging for seven days straight. We should go there as soon as we are done talking to the owner. I was sent here to meet a detective from Precinct 41. You have the insignia of the citizen's militia on your sleeve and on your back. I suppose you could be impersonating him. You could have gotten the insignia from the black market or forged it. But for now, I'm going to set those possibilities aside. I'm not from the Inspectorate General. Inspectorate General means internal affairs. What he's saying is he's not from the rat squad and isn't supposed to suspect such things. Yes, but I'm not them. I'm from criminal investigation. Yes. They are not just white rectangles. They bear a halogen watermark with the letters RCM and a pattern resembling the street grid of Ravachol West. I would ask you to step into the headlights of my motor carriage, but again, it's none of my concern. I just need you to do your job. You mean you don't have a badge? Oh. If you didn't have your badge, then that would be very bad. You would need to report it on my shortwave. But since you do have it, we can go straight to the task at hand. I can see you drank last night and the night before, and that you are still drunk now. But I have seen officers go through worse. Much worse. If you need something for your headache, there is a general store nearby. But as I said, the dead body should be our number one concern. After you, officer.
Hello, sweetie. Wait, who's sweetie? You're a handsome man, officer, with your mustache and your chiseled jaw and that silly dimple on your chin. But dear, you're not for me. I'm too old and too married besides. You must forgive me. I'm getting so scatterbrained. I completely forgot to introduce myself. I'm Lena. My husband Morel and I are staying with our friend Gary just down the street, but I come here for tea when they're away. This Lena is wacky enough for the Motley Crew. Hire her on the spot. Yes, dear. Uh, I'm a paraplegic. A paraplegic is someone with limited or no ability to use the lower half of their body. Paraplegia is caused by spinal cord injuries, like falling from a great height or a grenade explosion. No, dear. I'm not quite that old, although I was injured in the line of duty. Nothing so glamorous, dear. Though, when I was young, I dreamt of planting the Revacholian flag on some figurative peak. I was a training and development manager at a rapidly expanding mail-order shoe company. You'd think it would be a safe job, but I had to be everywhere, and, well, once I happened to be under some faulty scaffolding, I was lucky. This was almost twenty years ago, and I was compensated exceptionally well. One can only dream of such payoffs nowadays. No problem. There is no bitterness in her voice. She accepted the curiosity her condition inspires a long time ago. Whatever do you mean? Ah, yes. Probably roll with me by the Fletchers. People often quote the Fletchers at me. Morel says it's my theme song. Of course, dear. Good luck with your case. Simple little cadence. He seems to be making it up as he goes. From another planet. Hey there. It's the jam, my man. It's a traffic jam for the ages. Harbor gates up the street are shut tight. No explanation given. Workers on strike, scabs agitating, and all around clusterfuck. Meanwhile, we're all stuck here in long-haul limbo for days upon days upon days. Upon days. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's official. He too agrees. This is the antechamber of the afterlife. Feels like forever. Like I was born on this here roundabout and this was all I ever knew. Just me and the metal and the tires, the oil and the fumes of mazout. Mazout is an antiquated term for heavy fuel oils. This man has a barely suppressed performative streak. Or he just likes unusual words. Or both. Yeah, imagine. It's been a whole week already. Behind the laugh, however, 
a touch of sorrow. So tell me, what do you need? It's like, whatever's going on over at the docks. Workers got a blockade set up, making demands, no way in or out. Some pretty wild stuff I hear. Like a giant new power crane in half the company? I forget what exactly. Good on them, I guess. I've heard talk there's a company rep in town too. Like a strike negotiator type. They'd know what's up. Precise demands and so on. Ah, yes. From the Wild Pines. We'll meet her soon enough, I'm sure. They want to keep that money flowing in, my man. ka -ching. He doesn't blame them, but he's not on their side. That's for sure. Anything else? Yeah, this ain't really my area of expertise. I just do my job and get paid. I have things to do and places to be. All of us do. Us lorry drivers. Cam, your nurse. You still hang around here waiting for this mess to end. Most have scurried off somewhere to get drunk or high. Or laid. Not that I blame them, really. Not my thing. Chasing transient pleasures is a drag these days. I prefer the examined life now. Thinking, reflecting, observing. He ain't one of us drivers. I know that. All accounted for. Otherwise, I haven't really asked about that. Been wasting time right here. Keep him busy. It's easy to see he's telling the truth. He's kept his nose out of the dark stuff. Analyzing the fundamental structural and psychological conditions of being stranded in the midst of a sea of motor lorries and their sad, despondent chauffeurs. Ask for his conclusion. A sense of surprise there ain't more bodies hanging from more trees. Oh, high-grade narcotics, illegal firearms, stuff like that. Time to arrest him. Relax. He's merely joking. Can't even get a few jokes past you, my man. I've got another haul of Falm cargo. Mostly sporting goods, tracksuits, and that kind of thing. They usually get shipped to Grad in the Occident. Though we've been making headway in the Il Moran market lately. This rockin' beauty. Sure is. Like a rash you can't get rid of. You interested in heavy-duty cargo machinery? A motor lorry, also called a camion, on Caillou and neighboring islands. This one looks roughed up enough to be some sort of found rust bucket. Maybe the A6. Good eye, my man. Yup, she's an old one, but reliable. Me and her spent a long time together. There it is again. A little touch of sadness beneath his cool. He thinks he spent too long in this lorry. We're pals and all, but I can't just freely hand out the merchandise. The bosses won't be happy. The man taps his fingers rhythmically against his arm. Ease into it. Don't go too far. This seems like a personal matter. Man, nothing's troubling me. Just the usual lorem and tropes and hopes, the road and the rhymes. This jam ain't helping either. That all the beans you got, Tommy? Damn, it really is hard to talk, man to man. Don't be a stranger. Before you stands a motor carriage. The bodywork is covered in blue and white livery, bearing the number 57. Vapor emanates from the large engine on the back of the vehicle. It hasn't had time to cool off yet. 
This must be the infernal machine that toy from oblivion. The Kupris Kanema motor carriage. In the cabin, you are welcomed by a set of steering levers, a radio microphone on a hook, a pull-out toolbox under the seat, and the soft glow of the fuel preheater gauge. The white suede feels luxurious under the touch, and the metal clutch handle so very familiar in your palm. As you tap on the gauge, the indicator pin jerks as if startled. It's in the large orange sector, indicating the engine is warm. Next to the gauge is a red switch, labeled heat. There's no use pressing the heat button. It won't start without the ignition key. Translation. We're not going anywhere right now. Alternative translation. Don't even think you can drive my MC. The frequency tableau lights up and the green button labeled Prime Line glows like a feline eye. And then you hear something. The soft purr of electrical kittens, radio waves cast far and wide over the metropolis. A woman's voice greets you through the static. This is Precinct 57. Hello, Lieutenant. How may I assist you? Hello, Alice. Please assist our colleague from the 41st precinct here. I'm putting him on. This is Officer Alice Demetri, Precinct 57. How may I assist you? Just a second, Officer. 10-2, 10-5. This is 41st. Come in. Over. A scrawny old man sits in a dusty cubicle, smoking, with a large white rectangle sewn on his vest. In front of him is a box-shaped apparatus with an array of wires and antennas. The radio switchboard. The man uses relay code. You've got this. You're a cop, and cops know relay code. 10-4, message received. 10-5, relay message. What's your status? Over. 10-18, state your message, sir. Ten four. your badge should have most of your personal details. Look over that. Over. Four. Anything else for you, sir? Over. But you said... N never mind. 10-9. Over. 10-4. Message received. This is a very serious situation. I need to 10-22 the captain. Over. Is it him? What does he want? Says he lost his badge and needs to report it. He what? He lost his badge? This is communication officer Jules Pidieu, sir. Over. You mean your partner? Over. What is he saying? <coughs> He's asking who you are. I'm his goddamn partner. It's your partner, satellite officer Wittmar, sir. Over. Did he lose his memory along with his fucking badge? Who lost his badge? Dick fucking Mullen. Who do you think? It's Officer Dick Mullen from the bestseller Dick Mullen and the Lost Identity. Dick Mullen is not your name. It's the name of a fictional detective who would not lose his badge. Defend yourself. Immediately. They're laughing at you. Ten 
Then for I hear you, officer. I'm just going to make a note here that you are in pursuit of your misplaced badge. Over. Fuck me! Mac, come here! You've got to hear this! Dick Mullen lost his badge! What's going on? Supercarpe lost his badge. He lost his what now? His badge. He lost his goddamn fucking badge. 10-9, come again. I didn't get that. Over. New heights even for Captain Sober. Ask him. <laughs> Ask him if he's lost his gun, too. Sergeant Thorson wants to know if you lost your gun, too. Over. Check your pockets. Check your... Holy fuck. You don't know where it is, do you? No. It's gone. It's not fucking on you. Don't sweat it, Bratan! You don't need a gun to have fun! We can still have fun! It's not all over! 10-9, come in, officer. Did you get my question? We were wondering about your gun. Over. Lying? Over the phone, it's easy. Just say it like it's the truth, and then it becomes it. He says he didn't. Thank God for that. That would have been a nightmare. I don't even want to imagine the poor prick who has to relay that kind of news to the captain. Losing his badge is bad enough. Tell him to find it, and fast. We can't have some gangbanger running around with it. We're all glad to hear you've not lost your gun, officer. You need further assistance. Over. Roger that. Ten ten. Over and out. 18 kilometers to the south, in the 41st Precinct's relay booth, a small crowd has gathered around communication officer Jules Oldboy Pudier, around a dozen cops. The small room is filled with cigarette smoke, a buzz with laughter when Officer Judith Minow enters. Her left arm is in bandages and her hair trimmed short. What is going on here? Did something happen? What happened is my partner made contact, and it's not good. He's lost his badge. He seemed confused, delirious even. Mac, the torso Torson, is finger-fucking his fist, laughing hoarsely and apparently telling some dirty story to his partner, Chester McLean, near the entrance. Yeah, Mullen was fucked, all right. Sounded fucking drunk to me. Yeah, Max right. That was some gnarly shit there. Enough! None of this is funny. It's fucking sad. That's what it is. He's a cop. He's one of us, goddamn this. We must help him. Yeah? How do you fucking plan to do that, huh? Get him off the drink? Go jogging with him in the morning and get him on car juice? He's a lost man. I just know we can't give up on him when he's at his weakest. He wouldn't. Mac, man the door. You know what he told me? I don't want to get better. I want to get worse. Those were his words. This shit does not leave this room. Not a word of this to the captain. Or anyone else. We'll give him a couple of days to pull his shit together. I guess I can hold up the report for a few days. Good. Okay, everybody. Nothing but a prank call here. We all got our laughs. Now get back to work. Far north, on the other side of the motorway, the officer quietly hunches with his hand in the motor carriage. A metallic drawer slides out from under the seat and clicks into place. 
The tools inside are neatly organized. Take what you need, officer. It's going to be a long case. I'm not protective of my tools, like some men are. He's clearly a little protective of his tools. But what can you do? Work is work. The handles are long and sleek. Snap, snap, go the cutters in your hand. The pull-out toolbox slides back into its nest. Preheater gauge casts a warm glow on the steering levers and the radio on its hook. 